Here's my... Some of you will know the history of Rasputin. What do you know about him? Let's hear a couple of answers quickly called out. Yeah. He got three, shot three times without being killed. He got shot three times without being killed, yeah. Sorry? And poisoned. And poisoned, yeah. Sorry? He used to minister to the Queen. Yeah, he used to minister to the Queen. Yeah. Sexually promiscuous. Hundreds, thousands of women. I mean, that line, Russia's greatest love machine. Um, the Boney M basically get the history right. This was this guy, Rasputin. Um, Grigor Rasputin. Serbia, he was from, his parents were Russian peasants. He lived last part 19th, beginning of the 20th century, the last days of Imperial Russia, just as communism was beginning to get a grip on that place. He went to theological college. He got a grasp of the Bible. Here's the basic theology of Rasputin. Without sin, there can be no repentance. Repentance is pleasing to God. In order to repent, you must sin in the first place. So Rasputin sinned it up so he had more to repent of so then there could be more glory to God. You see his basic theology structure? And he lived by that rule. He preached, preached, preached. He did sex, sex, sex. Hundred to Moscow's chicks. He was such a lovely dear. He, he had a semblance of religious respectability, the Queen of Russia, the Russian Tsar, um, thought he was wonderful, and yet he lived this wild party lifestyle. Now, I don't know that there's anybody here this morning who would actually say, Rasputin has right theology. But I just want you for a moment to do a little audit on your own private thoughts and perhaps examine whether it's the case that you might be tempted, that each of us might be tempted, to think, maybe there's a little of Rasputin that I find attractive. In just about every, I mean, let me just run with this theory. In just about every fiction book you read, or every movie on Netflix, there's a part of it where it builds to some passionate love scene. And the skill of the writer is to get me, the consumer, to so identify with the character that I want to be that character. And they, they reel me in. And in my better moments, I don't want this. And I think I'm pretty good at closing my eyes in those moments in the movies. But the storyline cleverly seduces me in into wanting to be like her, wanting to be like him. And so the, there's this little private hankering for a little Rasputin and, and some, perhaps, perhaps you're nodding, thinking, yeah, 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 sometimes it is exhausting being the good Christian girl. And I'd like to experience, maybe taste the darks just a little. Not to get burnt, not to live in it forever, but just to explore, taste, and see what it's like. I, I could be on holidays away from Christian friends. Well, today, our focus is on the life of the Christian. And what place for sin in the Christian life? And, and there are people here today, I know, who've been Christian for a long, long time. Some can't remember when they weren't Christian. But in this church, and one of the lovely things about our church, is that there are many of us who've come to trust Jesus Christ as adults. Some over the, even the last few weeks, some even the last few months. And, and some here who do not yet call Jesus Lord. Now, this is going to be an intensely practical couple of minutes for us. And um, it's about how we live as a Christian Monday through Saturday. And now just if you're not a Christian yet, you're so welcome. And um, it, it, it's not today, um, have a holiday if you're not a Christian, turn your brain off for the next 20 minutes. No, no, if you, this is really going to be helpful because if you become a Christian... It, this is going to be how to live. Um, if you were to make this step to trust Jesus, then what would it look like in your life? So here we are, point two on the outline. If you're following the outline, I hope you will be because some serious things are going to be said in a moment. Um, 
We're following in our teaching series, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. We're up to chapter five, just to reorientate us in case you missed the logic, the current status of Christian believers, chapter five, verse one, since we have been justified by faith, chapter five, verse one, um, therefore we have been justified. We saw that in the past we had been justified, so in the present we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've gained access, verse two, by faith, into the grace in which we stand. And so we re future rejoice in the hope. Past have been justified. We've gained access present into the grace by which we stand. And future, we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, how can I be sure of going to heaven? This was last week. Well, the big message was that the foundation of my assurance we saw, the, we saw the two significant adults in world history, the two significant persons in world history, Adam and Christ. We saw Adam's impact was that he brought sin into the world, that because of sin there was death in the world. Through Adam, all are in sin. He had colossal impact on the human race. And then the, that was the second biggest thing to happen to the human race. The biggest thing to happen to the human race was Christ. He brought the gift that overflowed. Adam's sin caused my problem. Christ died in my place. I had to die because of sin. Now Christ has died in my place. Adam brought death. Christ brought life. I can be justified. I can stand before God righteous, even though I'm in the wrong, because of what Jesus has done. There was an act in history through which I became a sinner. There was an act in history through when I became justified. Christ's death is bigger than Adam's sin, bigger than all sin. How big is Christ's death? Well, big, I mean, big enough to sin, atone for the sins of all the world, big enough to atone for the sins of Hitler and Putin and, and Lenin and Saddam Hussein and Rasputin. There's no sin for which Jesus' death is not big enough to answer. And so chapter 5, verse 20, and this is where we left it last week, the law was added so that trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So, the law points out my sin. When I see that I'm sinful, I say, oh, God is even more generous. And so the question comes, well, if it doesn't depend on me, it doesn't depend on me being good, if, if, if where there is more sin, Jesus is more gracious, more generous, could Rasputin be right? Shall we sin so that grace might increase? If it's not dependent on obedience, my obedience, it is dependent on Christ, shall we sin? You think about it personally. I'm at point three. Is sin something you go to so that God can be even more generous? Chapter six, sentence one. Shall we say then... Are we to continue in sin so that grace may multiply? And the answer is, sentence two, chapter six, absolutely not. By no means. And then there is a twofold answer. It's a past answer and a future answer, past answer. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us three who've been baptised into Christ Jesus, he's been all of us who've become Christian. Baptism is the normal way of becoming Christian, just like the wedding ceremony is the normal way of beginning to live together. When we were baptised, when we became Christian, we were baptised, verse 3, into his death. Therefore, we were baptised by him by baptism into death in order we were plunged into his death. We were immersed together with him into his death. The, re the reason actually here for mentioning burial is it's emphasising it was a real death that Jesus went through. And when we came to Christ, we identified with the death of Jesus. We were completely caught up with the death of Jesus. I used to be an Adam. I used to be caught in sin. Now I am immersed. I'm plunged. I'm surrounded by I'm caught up by Jesus and his death. To be baptised into Christ is to be joined into Christ. And, and that has happened to me. So the future, verse 4, the future sentence 4, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father. In the present, looking to the future, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Sentence 5, 
If we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, that past moment, we will certainly also be future in the likeness in the resurrection. So past, present, future. Shall I sin? No! Because I'm not Adam's anymore. I am Christ's. So, so, so what should I do? Sentence four, in order that, here up, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now that I am caught up in Christ, a different walk is expected. There's a new walk for me. I'm to start, now that I've become a Christian, I am to walk this new life. And there are four commands. See the first command, sentence 11, consider yourself. You must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You used to work for sin, now you are alive to God in Christ. Second command, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its, de its desires. This is verse 12. You used to obey sin, stop it. Just that last word in 12, desires, that, that's actually the word that stands passions, the word behind wrong sexual desires. That's one of the reasons I chose sexual sin here as the theme. You used to obey those passions. You used to obey your sexual desires. You used to obey your Rasputin. Stop it. Third one, sentence seven, do not present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness. The bits of you, the members of your body that do the wrong thing, the eyes that look lustfully, the eyes that look greedily at that new dress, that new purchase, the fingers on the keyboard that call up websites that you know you should not go to, the lips that abuse a colleague at work, using words, thoughts, expressions that you know Jesus would not use. The hand that touches a part of them that you know you should not touch. Verse 13, do not present your, the members of your body to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Offer the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. Offer your eyes for the reading of the scriptures. Offer your ears for the listening to the word of God. Offer your mouth, your hands to God. Fourth command, for sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. Sin, Adam, is not to rule you. Christ, grace, is to be your ruler. But you say, oh, Dominic, 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 it, it's, it's so hard. I mean, I'm, I make a resolution to do the right thing and then before I know it, I, I find myself doing the wrong thing. And Here's an encouragement. The encouragement is, verse 11, we have been freed of the need to sin. This is crucial. There used to be a need to sin, but no longer. See what's happened. Sentence, look down to sentence six. We know that our old self was crucified in him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We used to live for sin, but now you have been freed of the need. Since a person, seven, who has died has been set free from sin. Sentence seven is key. here. If you have died with Christ, then you have been freed of the need to sin. 
the person who is an Adam, the non-Christian person, is not free of the need to sin. Let me rephrase it without the double negative. Um, the person who is an Adam must sin. Yeah, the non-Christian person must sin. They cannot not sin. But Christian person, verse 7, you have been freed of the need. It's no longer compulsory for Christian person to sin. You Christian, you can choose, choose to sin or choose not to sin. The non-Christian has to sin. When the non-Christian sins, they're following their natural master. When a non it's just to be expected. When a Christian does the wrong thing, that's a tragedy. We'll come back to that in question comment time in a moment, if you like. Point four, second part of the chapter. And we get to the first verse of this second part of the chapter in verse 14, 15, and um, it throws up another problem for us. Given that we've been freed of the need to sin, here's the problem. Sentence 14. Sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. I'm, I'm freed of the need. Somebody might think, no law, no, no commands. I'm, I'm under grace. No law, no commands. Well, if I've got no law, no commands, is it, is it okay if I do what I want to do? I'm under grace. I want to be truly me, and what I want to do is a lot of Jesus, but just a little bit of Rasputin. So verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? Now, when Paul writes this, when he speaks of law and grace, he's speaking of eras or seasons, the era of law, then the era of grace. The era before Christ, before when Christ came, when Christ died, rose, gave the gift of salvation, that was the era of law. And Paul has spoken negatively of the law, but the problem was not actually with the law, the problem was the, with the inability of people to keep the law. But now I'm not under the era of law, I'm living in this era of grace, this era of generosity, can I do what I want? Whenever I want. And the answer is, last part of 15, absolutely not again. By no means again. Why? Because 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And the picture is, everyone is a slave of someone. It could be that you're a slave of sin, or it could be that you're a slave of Jesus. It could be that you're a slave of the devil, or it could be that you're a slave of the Lord. That's what verse 16 is saying. Now, we're on a musical morning this morning. And you, you, you'll be talking to people during the week and you say, how was church? And they say, oh, we had Boney M. Rasputin at church on Village on Sunday morning. You, well, I don't just want you to say that because we've got an image as a church to maintain. So I'm going to give you another song. I'm going to give you a Bob Dylan song. And Bob Dylan wrote this song, I think, on this verse. Verse 16 of chapter 6 of Romans. This is, you've got to serve someone. And again, keep your eyes on verse 16 and the lyrics of this, this verse and chorus. Watch, watch this.
So Dylan's point is that everybody is either under the rulership of the devil or under the rulership of the Lord Jesus. And I think Bob Dylan is putting well the case of Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? There's no middle ground, says Paul. There's no middle ground, says Dylan. You're a slave of one or the other. A problem immediately, I don't like the word slave. He uses the word serve in the song. But the problem with the word slave, and it is the word slave in Paul, is that it carries the connotation that the slave master may not have my best interests at heart. And we do have a picture of slave masters abusing slaves. And on the one hand of that, on the side of the devil, where it's the devil or sin and you're a slave of the devil, you're a slave of sin, it might look fun. But in the end, it's bad for you. You are abused by sin. But the connotation, on the other hand, is, well, could I get abused by God? No. I think Paul does understand that the illustration has a flaw, that the illustration doesn't quite work, which is why in 19 he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. This, this slave analogy, it doesn't totally work. It doesn't... Um, and I know, as somebody who uses illustrations to make points, I can say no illustration works perfectly. They all break down around the edges. And Paul is acknowledging that this one even breaks down around the edge. But the point is, you've got to serve someone stands. So who should I serve? What should I do? 19. Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Now, at that point, there's a personal question. Who do you want to serve, Village Church? I mean, you might be visiting today. You might be a Christian person visiting from another. Who do you want to serve? Who are you going to serve? The devil or the Lord? Well, the, the challenge here is to offer yourself, offer the parts of your body as slaves to righteousness. Shall I sin because I'm afraid of the need? Absolutely not. Shall I sin? You've got to serve someone, serve the Lord. There's an encouragement then. Um, and the encouragement is the trajectory. The, Paul's speaking to people who've previously been baptised into Christ, who are Christian, who've trusted Christ, who said thank you to Jesus for his death. And he says, here's the trajectory. Verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. You did whatever you wanted to do. You just ate up your godliness, godlessness. You were serving the devil. Where did it leave you, that godless pattern? What fruit, 21, were you getting at the time from the things which are now, which are, which are now ashamed? Um, the end of those things is death. I, I think back to my non-Christian past. Before I was a Christian, when I was a slave of sin... And I, I think back of the things that I did. At one moment, in a moment, fun it seemed. But actually, as I reflect back, all I can think of is negative. All I can think of is shame. And the outcome, if you keep going in that trajectory, the end of 21, the end of those things is death. It, I mean, here's the warning. If you start to tinker, if you start to fantasise, if you start to think, oh, I wouldn't mind just a little bit of that, and you, you decide to get into it, and the, the action becomes a habit, and the habit becomes a compulsion, the compulsion becomes a character, and the end point is death. What about righteousness? The, the other way, 22. Now you have been set free from sin, and now become slaves to God. The fruit, the outcome you get is sanctification and in the end, eternal life. The trajectory now is heaven. Conclusion, the wages of sin is death. The outcome of living under the realm of sin is death, but the free gift of God 
the outcome of living under the realm of Jesus is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So bottom line, challenge, what are you going to do? What's the take-home question from Romans 6? Christian friend, how are you going to live? What are you going to tinker in? What are you going to play with in your mind? What are you going to fantasise about? What are you going to long for? What are the habits that's going to mark your life? What's the character you're pursuing to develop? How will God know you? The wages of sin, the trajectory of sin, the outcome of sin, death. The outcome, the benefit, the result for the slave of righteousness trajectory, eternal life. So, conclusion, point five. Shall we sin? Well, what if you're in Adam? What if you're here this morning and not Christian yet? Shall you sin? Yes, you shall. You will sin. You can't stop yourself. And even on your own standards, non-Christian friend, if you, I'm not gonna, you, if you decide, I'm not going to do this, pick something, tell a lie. I'm not going to tell lies anymore. You will not be able to do it. You're a slave to sin. You can't stop. You, you're, you're an addict to sin. But shall you sin, non-Christian friend? No. Of course not. You want to switch from Adam to Christ. You want to trust Jesus. You want to be baptised. You want to trust his death. You want to get caught up in his death, identified with Christ in his death and resurrection, plunge into his death and the benefits of his death and resurrection. And so I say to you, non-Christian friend here this morning, talk to Jessica, talk to Conrad, talk to Leah, talk to Alvin, talk to Gaynor, talk to any of our Introducing God team about coming to Introducing God. And finding out about that new life in Christ. What if you're already Christ's? What if you are a Christian? Shall we sin? Absolutely not. One, we're freed of the need. And two, we have a new master, a new person to serve. So, pastoral word to village church. I don't think there are many here who are living Rasputin life. There, I mean, as I've pastored people here over the years, we've actually had quite a lot of people, I think, over the years who've, who've come to Jesus from pretty wild lives. Who've had elbows deep in sin and then by an extraordinary miracle of God have been buried in Christ, identified with his death and resurrection. But pastoral word, I do think some of us are tempted just to be a little bit like that. Not the whole thing. But we, those of us in Christ, can look over at the devil's slaves and think, oh, is the grass greener on that side of the fence? Wouldn't mind a little bit of that grass. And we're tempted to play with the desire to toy with it and we allow it to sit and fester in our minds and we give ourselves to thinking about it, we browse about it on social media. I think there is a temptation that needs to be resisted. And I suspect even as I say this, for each of us there are things you, you think, yeah, if I really was to live as a slave of Christ. There are some things that, there are habits that I would stop. There are actions that I would stop. There are, there are things in my life where the, the idea has moved to a habit and is beginning to become a character and a beginning to become a pattern. And I want to stop that. So I conclude by saying, Friends, who are you serving? What is it that drives you? What is your priority? 
That's my question from Romans 6 for us today. Let me lead in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this journey that we've been able to go on these seven, eight weeks through Paul's letter to the Romans. We thank you that we could see that we are in the wrong before you. That no one is righteous, not even one. We thank you that we've been able to see that beautiful but now a righteousness has been revealed in the gospel that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. We thank you that this saving grace of yours is accessed by faith alone and that even Abraham trusted that it was faith alone that it's always been faith alone. And we thank you that because of Jesus, we now have peace with God. We are justified by his actions. We're at peace with him. We have a hope of glory. We thank you that this rests not on us, but on Christ, that he rescued us from under the realm of Adam. And we pray today for a work of your spirit in each of our hearts and minds and lives and members that we should not continue in sin, that we would cut it off and rather than serve our old master sin, we would serve our new master, Christ. And we pray for a work of your spirit to this end In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we'll take questions and comments in a moment. And uh, let's invite the band up first. Would you please stand with us as we sing together How Marvellous. Let's sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall Savior's love 
back into question time and I appreciate we're running late so we're going to have very this is going to be one day cricket Christian question time where the answers are fast and slightly inaccurate um. <laughs> okay so just two two quick questions here we go um, is your mic on yeah it's supposed to be on yeah okay yeah. um we go from needing to sin to having a choice to sin if that is true why is it still so easy to sin why do we sometimes feel like we can't resist and have to give in doesn't feel like we have a choice. Sure. I'm just going to speak personally about my experience on this one. Um, I find that the more I'm in the Bible, the, more, the less I'm likely to sin. And um, the less I'm in the Bible, the more I'm likely to sin. This is just my experience. And um, uh, if I'm filling my mind with um, Facebook, if I'm filling my mind with Instagram, then I'm likely to be greedily pursuing the things that all the experiences that other people are sharing on their social media, if I'm filling my mind with the scriptures, I'm actually going to be thinking, I want to be my heart to be after God. I think I have a real choice to go one way or the other. I think I am responsible for making that choice. And I think, um, but there are things that I can do that will make it more likely that I'll end up sinning and there are things that I can do as a Christian that will make it less likely that I'll end up sinning. Yeah. Okay, and finally, uh, what's the death that's been referred to in chapter 6? Because not every sin I commit will lead to an end of my mortal life. So what's the death that is the outcome of sinning? Yeah, yeah, the death that, was, that is spoken of, the wages of sin is death, is actually the eternal death of the hell. It's the eternal death of the, of the long... The final outcome of living under the realm of the devil, of choosing to engage in the, the behaviours of the devil, of choosing to defy God, is, is that I will end up spending eternity with the devil in hell. That's the, that's the wages of sin that is death. Um, uh, it's not that every moment of sin I immediately get death. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> there are times when I do get judgment related to a particular sin. You've been speeding and you get a speeding fine and there's judgment immediately coming. But you just, and you think, oh, that was terrible. The New South Wales police, they're so overzealous. Um, and you, um, you ignore the fact that there were a hundred times you sped and you didn't get pinged for it. Um, and yet that was mercy of the New South Wales police 99 times. And in the moment there's justice, you think, that's outrageous. What you and I deserve for our sin is eternal death. That, had ha that, that I have sinned so frequently and that I'm still alive and not in hell, they are all signs of the mercy of God because what I really deserved was judgment a long time ago. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thanks so much. Let's enjoy morning tea in a few minutes' time, but our final song now. <laughs> Finished. Let's stand together one last time and sing about the amazing uh, sacrifice of Jesus and that on the cross he bore our sin, our shame, and it was finished, our salvation. Second. 
Bang. I think it was better than Rasputin any day of the week. Um, guys, this is the, the f- kind of final moments of our formal gathering, but let me encourage you, uh, we are all about relationship with God and others here, and so let me encourage you to have morning tea, it's out the back, I can see Rob plundering the coffee, uh, so it's going to be nice and hot for you, um, but for now let me pray uh, in finishing up uh, after all the things that we've heard this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you that, uh, yeah, in your grace, you've given us your spirit and that you uh, help us uh, choose to live a life of righteousness rather than one of sin. Uh, Help us, uh, yeah, reject a life like Rasputin, uh, taking abuse of grace in a sense. Uh, We pray that you might help us take seriously what sin is and delight in what Christ has done for us, that we may live free from it, uh, not continuing in that way. Help us rejoice with ragged voices uh, as we continue to remember that Christ loves us uh, and in him you bring us redemption. Amen.